This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. <laughs> no kidding. There's enough stuff to get stressed out about, but <laughs> we're going to stress you out today. This is History Lens with John David Ann. He's a history professor. No, we're not going to stress them out, Jay. Our viewers are going to really enjoy this. Yeah, if you like this stress. Is, this, is, <laughs> this is interesting <laughs> stuff. Come on. Stress-free. He's stress a history free professor, viewing. which gives him a certain cachet in dealing with, you know, history. Not history, only yes. history today in the making, but history years ago to right. try to get a pipeline on where, where it's all been, where it's all going. Right. And today we're talking about the history, I love this topic, yeah. of crisis manufacturing. Manufacturing, right. Because we, we have right. seen that only a few days ago in the right. wall. That's right, that's but right. But is, there's a long well, history of it. Well, so yeah, so uh, Trump has been accused of manufacturing a crisis at the border, a national security crisis, in order to build his wall. And so I thought, you know, it might be interesting uh, to, to study this backwards by putting, essentially what we do at History Lens is we put contemporary affairs into historical perspective. Yep. So we're going to go and back. In the process, to, we learn history. Right, exactly. <laughs> no, that's right. So we're going to go back and we're going to learn about the history of crisis manufacturing, which, which uh, some of the characteristics, it does involve lying. Um, there has to be, there's definitely some untruths in there. It also involves something about the situation which is true, a little thing about the situation which is true, which then is turned into this massive lie, a very big lie. In fact, um, Hitler thought the bigger the lie, the better the lie. This, you know, this reminds me of some of the <laughs> points in that New York Times article about Vladimir Putin. Oh. about his disinformation campaign. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and all yeah. the things you just mentioned are in that, in that right, protocol. Right, yeah. right. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, this playbook is old, but really Hitler was the one who perfected this playbook. And uh, sometimes these, uh, in the military, these operations are called false flag operations. Right. And we'll look at a couple of false flag operations. So, uh, but I think it's important to understand crisis manufacturing in historical perspective. Yes. So uh, we're going to do so it. So excited. Right, right. Okay, so start at, start at, I wouldn't say start at the beginning, but start, start at <laughs> well, something memorable well, okay, in American so there, history. Okay, so there have been so many of these that you can't actually cover all of them in 30 minutes. So what I did was really pick some kind of important ones and several in the 20th century. But we're going to start with the crisis over the National Bank which took place in uh, the late 1820s and, and especially in 1832. And this so-called crisis over the National Bank was something that Andrew Jackson used to get reelected in, in 1832. And then he turned around and began withdrawing deposits from the National Bank and eventually destroyed it. Uh, so, so what it's was called scapegoating? Yeah, it's it, it, yes, isn't that right? yes, yeah. in a way, it's scapegoating. So Jackson hated the National Bank. The National Bank was a bank chartered by the U.S. government, uh, and it was, but it was designed to provide capital to private individuals uh, for uh, projects, for various projects. You know, you could get go to your local branch of the National Bank and get a loan for you know to buy land or to build a railroad, to build a canal, et cetera. But so Jackson did not like the bank. He didn't like paper money. He didn't like uh, states and the national government having, their, uh, having some kind of play in the national economy. He thought this did not represent limited government. And so he began to attack the bank, and especially in, in 1832, during the election of 1832, the Congress, which was controlled by the Whigs, tried to pass a recharter of the bank because the bank had to re be rechartered by the federal government every 20 years. And so the Congress had to, they had to get this bank rechartered, right? So they passed a bill rechartering the bank and Jackson vetoed it. And then he used uh, his vetoing of this recharter to attack the bank and then in his campaign, he attacked the bank again and again as a corrupt institution, an institution that didn't represent the common people, an institution that uh, violated the values of the country. So this is, 
It, it is, uh, so there was no crisis with the bank. I mean, the bank actually was quite successful. That's why the, the Whigs wanted to recharter it. Erie Canal. Yes, the Erie Canal, uh, railroads throughout the country. This was all built with money uh, loaned out by the National Bank. So, so there was no crisis. Uh, so, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, Jackson manufactured a crisis to get rid of the bank. He was a very aggressive politician, wasn't he? He was. He, he was. was the guy who did the Trail of Tears. That's correct. The, yes. The Indians yes. out of Georgia. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's another, you know, that's for another session, that's actually. A, another <laughs> black eye for yes. him. Yeah. No, that's true. It's another black eye for him. And so, he manufactures this crisis. Now, the truth in this there was a truth that the bank did serve more elite uh, entrepreneurs and institutions. That's true because it tended to loan out uh, larger amounts of money and the bank branches tended to, tended to be in big cities, not in small towns. So, uh, but uh, Jackson uh, uh, saying that the, the, the bank was destroying the American economy was actually just the opposite. The National Bank uh, was considered to have really raised the American economy between about 19, uh, 1810 and 1830. So it was actually a big boon okay, so to the, the American economy. the attack was for bad purpose. The attack involved lies. Uh, he doubled down on the attack. Yes, that's true, he did. And he got away with it. And he won, actually. He won re-election, and then he systematically removed deposits from the bank, and eventually... The Beat bank, up the bank. The bank. It was, it's complicated, but eventually the bank failed. So, yes. you know, there, there's a whole yeah. bunch of things in there that are really scary in terms well, of it's, history in it's more recent it's, times. It's, it's, a, it's a decent uh, comparison in terms of crisis manufacturing. So yeah. I, think it, I think it actually fits in there. Um, so, yeah, so uh, a, a long and infamous history of crisis manufacturing. And in the modern era, then, we can talk about the National Bank. But, but actually... Most of the major uh, incidents of crisis manufacturing have taken place in the 20th century. So if it's all right, I'd like to move to the 20th century. Yeah, I'd like you to do yeah, that. Okay. And, I, and I'd like you to connect it up with propaganda, with yeah. the fact that media was much more mature in right, the 20, 20th right, century. That's so true. Um, and, that, uh, and that we had, we had a growing re realization. We, I mean, you know, everybody had a growing realization that you could get away with a lie using the media. Yeah. The same formula, yeah. double down on the media, right. and nobody would ever know, and you'd right. get away with it. Right. No, that's, that's, so, the interesting question about the media. So, the early 19th century, the early 1800s, provides a moment where uh, there are lots more newspapers and printing presses become much more efficient and everything. So, that's one moment. In the early 20th century, then you have new media, mediums, new forms of communication, including film, and then eventually radio. And these new forms of communication allow those who would manufacture crises uh, more forums to do their business. And I had a point. In yeah. the 19th century, with all those newspapers around, yeah. with, in Andrew Jackson's day, people had face-to-face -face discussions about the yeah. news. Yeah. You have more newspapers, there, were, there was more engagement about more the More than face-to-face -face discussion, they had fist fights about the news. Right on. <laughs> so, well, you know, there's a point there. Yeah. And, and when you get into the 20th century, yeah. certainly the 21st, yeah. news is on a, on a radial basis. In right. other words, it is, right. it is thrown at you, yeah. and you're alone, you're reading the newspaper, yeah. watching the TV oh, or yeah. the radio, yeah. <clears throat> and, you, and you don't have the face-to-face -face experience. Your family not necessarily going to talk to you about it. Yeah. Your friends not necessarily going to talk yeah. to you about it. And so you get it, um, and it can stick yeah. because you never yeah. have a chance to test it out no, that's in true. engagement. That's true. I mean, 19th century, the newspaper business was a, was a business where there was tremendous uh, disagreement in the newspapers, and, and particular newspapers would go for particular groups of people. And so, yeah, there was a lot of diversity. That's true. Uh, that, that especially with radio, then uh, there was uh, maybe less way to rebut a particular argument or to, you know, to discredit a particular argument. Yeah, that's true. So the, the next major incident of crisis manufacturing took place after the end of World War I. And this was actually a time, of course, when Germany was was in a crisis, actually. They didn't manufacture that particular crisis. The crisis was that they lost the war, and uh, the Kaiser was forced, their leader was forced to abdicate, and then there was actually an attempted 
socialist revolution, a putsch in, in Germany in 1919. And of course, Hitler tried his own coup later on, I think in 1922. But so behind the scenes, uh, the question is, who was to blame for the end, for the German failure in World War I? Whose fault was it that Germany lost this war, that it, they had put so much blood and treasure into? And so Hitler writes a book. Uh, Adolf Hitler is a young man. There it is, uh, Mein Kampf. Yes, ah, yes, there he is with his uh, funny-looking mustache and all. So this is a later Just publication. Just looking at him is chilling. <laughs> this they, is a first-class psychopath, and there yeah, you have it. Yeah, but he's also really par excellence. He is a crisis manufacturer. Yep. So. So what he does in Mein Kampf is he describes a situation where he believes a big lie has been perpetrated on the German people by Jewish bankers and financiers, and he says they blame General Ludendorff for the failure of the, the Germans in World War I. And then he goes on to say, but the real big lie is, or the, or the real truth, which is Hitler's own big lie. Okay, there's, there's two big lies here. There's the big lie that Hitler identifies, and, there, and then there's the, the, the one with the Jews uh, blaming Ludendorff. And then there's a second big lie that actually Hitler uh, doesn't identify, but uh, perpetrates against the, the Jews in Germany and says that actually, the people who were to blame for the German failure was uh, Jewish bankers and financiers themselves. Not only uh, should they stop blaming Ludendorff, they, it was their fault that, uh, that Germany lost. So this is, a, this is uh, it uh, eventually becomes a crisis, right? It becomes a situation in which uh, uh, Jews are put under a lot of pressure in Germany and eventually detained, and then of course the Holocaust. But, mm -hmm. But so the big lie here is one in which Hitler uses to accuse the Jews of, of uh, undermining the German state and leading to the failure in World War I. And there's, no tr there's, there's absolutely no truth in he that. He knew how particular. to play the press. He knew how, he to, knew play how to do propaganda. He knew how to that's do right. a lie and hit people in, you know, in their weaknesses. That's right. That's right. They were vulnerable. Right? That's right. It was no, after that's the right. war. That's they were right. feeling unhappy. Uh, let him blame somebody. Scapegoating again. No, that's yeah. right. This is scapegoating again. And so, so, so you have that situation of the big line. We'll come back to Hitler in a minute because Hitler, of course, is a very important guy in this. He is, like I said before, he is somebody who really uh, knows how to create these crises in order to achieve his goals. So, but that really the next in incident of a crisis that was manufactured in order to achieve a kind of nefarious goal happened actually not in Europe, not in the United States, but in East Asia in 1931. So if we go to East Asia... I love traveling around the world with you, John. <laughs> yeah. so That's we, John David N., history professor <laughs> at HBU. Right. We won't take a break because this is so interesting. Ah, okay, yeah. well, no break. Okay, so... So uh, in 1931, the, the Japanese had an army stationed in Manchuria, which was a part of China, but which was really controlled and run by a Chinese warlord who, you know, he was supposed to be connected to, he was being paid off by the Japanese army, but uh, he wasn't really cooperating very much. And so the Japanese army, and this was the Japanese army in Manchuria, not the Japanese government back in Tokyo, the Japanese army decides, you know what, we're going to take matters into our own hands and we're going to produce something which will, uh, which will lead to the takeover of Manchuria. And by the way, this is the picture that we have in our background is the Manchurian incident. So there's the Manchurian incident. And what happens is the Japanese high command in, in the army in Manchuria creates an incident. And the incident is they blow up a piece of this railroad. This railroad was actually controlled by the Japanese government. And they blow up a piece of the railroad themselves, and then they blame Chinese bandits for blowing up this piece of railroad. And they use this as a justification to invade all of Manchuria. It creates a war, a justification it's, for war. It eventually leads to the Sino-Japanese War And that sounds China. so much like what happened in Odessa not too long ago, 
with the Russians? Yes. And yes. in in, uh, yeah. in Poland yeah. and Ukraine, Ukraine. No, that's true. Yeah, I not, mean, not too yeah. long ago. Putin is a very good crisis manufacturer. That's true. It's, it's yeah. a Russian thing. A short story. Yeah. I, I was uh, when I was in the service, I was involved in an investigation. Oh, yeah. of, a, of a defector that jumped off a Russian ship and oh my God. tried to get on a Coast Guard oh. ship off Martha's Vineyard. Okay. And when he jumped <laughs> off, the Russians wanted him back. Obviously. Oh yeah. So they fabricated this whole affair about how he was really a thief. Oh, and he had stole money from the ship's oh, safe really? oh. <laughs> on the Soviet sky okay? Yeah. And, and ultimately, they got him back on that basis. Really? It was a complete fabrication. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, there are some situations yes. and some cultures where this kind of thing leading to a war or otherwise achieving a nefarious purpose right. is based on a complete and utter lie. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I, I don't know about culture, but certainly there are certain regimes that have had a kind of loose relationship to the truth. Okay, regimes. And, and once you can, once you have that loose relationship to the truth, then there are all kinds of opportunities <laughs> that open up. I mean, this is bad. This is, you know, nefarious opportunities open up. So, uh, Hitler was a proponent of the big lie. So, so back to the Manchurian incident. So the Japanese invade Manchuria and the Japanese government back in Tokyo doesn't know what to do because the, the army's acting on its own. And they keep telling the army, well, back into the barracks, and then the army doesn't go back into the barracks. And then they say, okay, hold your positions right there. And then the army goes forward and invades more. <laughs> and it's, it spins out of the control of the Japanese government. You essentially have a rogue army in Manchuria. This is referred to by military historians as, as a false flag operation. Ah, right, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. This is crisis manufacturing. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so you have that crisis, and then in the same decade, you have another crisis, which leads to another war. So Manchurian incident leads to the Sino-Japanese War, and then in 1939, you have another crisis that's manufactured, that leads to World War II. What was so, that? so this crisis manufacturing stuff is really serious. So, of course, this, this second crisis manufacturing was done by Hitler and by the Nazis, and it was a pretext to invade Poland in September 1939. So here's what happens. So in August 1939, Hitler and his high command, including uh, Goebbels, create all of these incidents. And they create them, and then they make it look like the Polish are doing this. And this is this cone. There's a, they burn down a house in Germany and blame it on the Polish. Uh, and then this culminates on August 31st, 1939, in an incident in which uh, Goebbels sends some German nationals across the border into Poland, dresses them up in Polish military uniforms sends them back across the border. That's right. Sends them back across the border to attack a radio station. Uh, the name of the radio station is the Gleiwitz radio station. So this is, there's, there's the radio station right there. This is known as the Gleiwitz incident. And because of this, uh, Hitler blames of this on the Polish, of course, and the next day declares war on Poland. Perfect. What a scenario. Yeah, yeah. And it's and all phony like a $3 bill, all of it. It's, it's all people yeah, it's, believe it. it's manufactured. They want to believe there, it. there are tensions, of course, between Poland and Germany. Capitalize but, on that. But it's blown up into this big crisis in order for Hitler to use his military and invade Poland. And of course, that begins uh, kind of begins World War II. Well, it was I mean, Blitzkrieg. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it starts. But he had all the he had all the armaments lined up on the border. No, that's right. This to, was it well was a planned step transaction. Yes, it, it was it was not actually a reaction to the. To the, Not at all. <laughs> to the the attack on the radio station. So we so, begin yeah. to see this repeating in the 19th century and the 20th century, right. where uh, politicians, uh, regimes, as you right. say, right. Uh, use this as a technique That's to right. get what they wanted. That's right. And that That's often included war or other right. fisticuffs. That's right. That's right. And so. I mean, it's really sad. That's the human condition. Well, you have to do that. In yes. Order to, in order to, um, it's, you know, it's it's a bad activity. It's really uh, it's dangerous, actually. Yeah. Well, lying is um, bad, yeah, but lying lying for a purpose like creating a war right. that's and even it, much worse. And it's uh, you know it's outside the norms of of the governments that are that are you know uh, being attacked. And people in don't some know. cases outside of the norms of the governments that are perpetrating it. And and you know it's so yeah it's yeah it, so crisis manufacturing has the potential to be very dangerous. It's, I wouldn't say it's always very dangerous, but it has that potential. Mm. And so 
uh, there's another example, and this example is much closer in time to our own time, and it's actually in the United States once again. So we've had the, the national, national bank crisis in the United States, and now uh, the, the crisis over Iraqi weapons, weapons of, of mass, mass destruction. destruction. That's right. So, so this is a crisis that was created by uh, top Bush administration officials who had some evidence, they had some evidence, that Saddam Hussein in Iraq was developing weapons of mass destruction. Now, they didn't have any evidence that he had actually succeeded in, uh, in developing weapons of mass destruction. So in, in some cases, they actually created the evidence. So if we can look at the, uh, this is a, this is a, it's called an aluminum tube for uh, uranium enrichment, and this is actually from a slideshow that Colin Powell did at the United Nations to justify uh, the Bush administration planning and then executing an invasion of Iraq. Yeah, you know, I told you before, I thought it came from Costco, <laughs> maybe Lowe's Hardware. Yeah, okay, yeah. Hardware Hawaii, yeah, whatever. It's, <laughs> it's definitely, unfortunately, it's definitely fiction because they never found any evidence that Saddam had no, actually never, produced. We've had, we have had how many years now since that time? Right. Right. Um, to look at some more than 20 years. Yeah, they never found years. any weapons of mass destruction. Right. So, so it started with, with something, there was a little bit of truth there, that Saddam did have a program to develop weapons of mass destruction. He just never had the resources to do it because he was under sanctions by uh, NATO and, mm -hmm. and, the, and, and the United States in the, in the late 1990s. And so, so what, what happens out of this is that the crisis is created by blowing up this program into actual weapons of mass destruction. Now, the result of this, of course, was the invasion of Iraq, and so... What, what year was that now? It was 2003, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one could argue, well, the, the invasion got rid of Saddam Hussein. Yes, it did, but, but it also destabilized a good portion of the Middle East. Saddam had, uh, had his own population on lockdown. Um, he had a substantial uh, military capability, and so people around him, countries around him had to respect that capability. Uh, after Saddam went down, it actually strengthened Iran. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the border situation with Iraq and Syria, uh, you know, that became much more porous. And it, it opened up the, the invasion, actually, because it destabilized Saddam, the, the, the control in Iraq. Then it, then it opened up northern Iraq. To, uh, to kind of no government at all, which eventually led to ISIS, yeah. uh, the development of yeah. this terrorist organization that actually set up shop in northern Iraq. Yeah. And, uh, and in Syria as well, it helped to destabilize Syria and along with several other things. And see what happens, yeah, dominoes, so, dominoes. Yeah, so it was, it was devastating for the Middle East. And is. I think if one evaluates it fairly, I think one would have to say that that you know, on the on balance, it was just a disaster for, for the world. And the irony, the irony is Colin Powell, who had advised Herbert yeah. Walker Bush, yeah. not to right. not to take over, uh, not to topple Saddam Hussein right. back in the in the nineties. That's right. The very same guy who was so wise about right. that right. now is right. party to the lie. Right. And the speech in the United Nations, I'm sure he loses sleep every day. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, you know, he's, he's, or he, of course, has backtracked since that time and, uh, you know, regrets that. But nonetheless, I mean, this is what can happen. So, so crisis manufacturing has the potential to be quite dangerous. Um, and I think that leads us, of course, back to the current a crisis that Trump is trying to manufacture at the southern border with Mexico, yes. trying to argue that there are terrorists and you know that that uh, th this is a, a national security issue and that's why we have to build a wall and and it's interesting to watch it play out. I mean, it's tragic because of course you have workers. A friend, a good friend of mine, works for the Coast Guard and he hasn't he hasn't received a paycheck in a while. Uh, this is terrible, actually. It's a terrible way to do policy, but so. Um, the, the idea that there are terrorists coming over the border is, of course, nonsense. And what's interesting about this is that uh, Trump has, has uh, kind of stayed true to the crisis manufacturing playbook. You, you make the lie big, and then you stick with it, and you double down on the lie. And this has created problems for him. Because people believe it. 
Yes, Some people, his but base believes his, it. His, yes, but actually when you look at polling numbers, after he went on national television and he went down to the border, was it last week that he did that? Then, uh, you know, then actually his, because he had no, there was no there there. There was actually no, there was no way that he could actually, uh, with evidence, show that there was terrorism at the border. And, and the, the picture from Trump at the border was surrounded by uh, uh, ICE agents, right, was him looking out on the Rio Grande and there was nothing there. There were no terrorists. There were no people. It was like a frog hopping in the weeds. Imagination. It, it, so so uh, this is, that's I think is really, I think it's actually uh, damaged Trump pretty seriously. So he walked back on that. So can we talk about his so, reasons so, right, and the right. circumstances so, of walking okay, back? So, so he made this big play last week to try to convince the American people, and it was thoroughly unconvincing. His polling numbers since that time have steadily tracked downward from about 43% to now he's at 40% and continuing to decline. And so, that limp speech he made. And yeah, so I think this has all created more problems for him uh, than it's actually helped him politically. And the other thing that's interesting is that Trump had been talking uh, recently about invoking a national security uh, crisis, saying that, that the southern border is a national emergency. And then uh, uh, in, under a national emergency declaration, uh, uh, forcing the American military to build the wall. And, and this raised uh, questions about uh, whether the president had the constitutional authority to do this, given that there was so little, little evidence of an actual crisis. And he, he, he just all of a sudden just kind of backed down and said, no, I don't think I can do that. And, and so it, that's an interesting thing. I in, think in the days before, he backed down. Yeah. There, were, there was an article by Bruce Ackerman, a okay. Yale law professor, okay. yeah. uh, in the New York Times, right. where he made the legal case. It was yeah. like a brief okay. with authority and footnote oh, and whatnot, yeah, yeah. saying there's no way that he could justify yeah. right. Um, right. building the wall on the basis of a national emergency right. Right. here. So, and it goes way back in American so, history and jurisprudence. Yeah, so I, th I think uh, cooler heads talk Trump out of this. Mm -hmm. And what it, to me, what it suggests about Trump is, is uh, he's willing to try to manufacture crises, but honestly, he's not very good at it. <laughs> he's not like Hitler. Uh, he, he's, he's just not that effective. I mean, he chose an issue which had so little traction. It was, we always thought that the wall was political theater, right? And, right. and there's nothing there's no, there. We don't need it. We yeah, don't there's, want there's, it. It's, it's not going to help. It's a complete <laughs> fiction. So that's part of his problem. He chose the wrong issue if he was going to manufacture a crisis. And, and I think he's, he's what, what, this, what this backing down suggests is that he's not willing to contravene the Constitution. Okay. In, in a let, significant but way. Let me, let me throw, let me throw. Okay. Another factor. Throw here. it, throw it, Jim. <clears throat> so he, here, I'll catch it. Ackerman and his <laughs> friends at Yale yeah. and uh, various other places, uh, other media in the country yeah. repeated that story. Right. And, and I guess even, even second, second, second best lawyers who may have advised Trump about it right. um, came to the conclusion yeah. that Ackerman was right and there right. was no mileage and, and it would go into the courts and the courts would stop him from doing it. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <clears throat> okay, right. so that's because the law, thank God, Goodness yeah, prevailed, yeah. Uh, or at least talking as a lawyer now. Yeah, J. Fidel yeah. Esquire. But if you uh, if you're yeah. operating strictly <laughs> strictly on a lie, yeah. the way Hitler did, right? You know, and um, you know maybe maybe having the press would reveal the lie. I mean, our press now is pretty well you know, good but, at revealing lies. But there was lies. no free press in Germany. That, that well, time, that, well, that's yeah. true. That's no, a there whole was other no story. free press. There was no uh, legislature, so the Reichstag had oh, burned true. down in 1933. And he owned all the judges. You know, six years before that, and and uh, never met again. No, it was not a democracy. It was it was a it was a totalitarian dictatorship. Yeah. So it's so, but if if it's, if, it's if not if a good comparison a to our system. Issue, yeah. If we have only a factual issue, and and Trump has some justification factually for the lie. Uh, not, not a legal you know, justification, but a factual justification, then I suggest to you that what he may have learned, you know, we're talking about going forward, no. what he may have learned in this incident with the wall is that don't, don't wrestle with the law, wrestle with the facts. 
Well, yeah, and maybe but, he's but, going to get better I at this. I don't, I don't know. Jay, the, the thing is, Trump has been uh, wrestling with the facts ever since he took <laughs> office. He's been, he's been uh, actually, I would say he's been a stranger to the facts uh, for quite some time. So I'm not sure that it, anything is well, Everybody's changed. watching him like a hawk now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, uh, you know, so crisis manufacturing is a dangerous business. And we've seen from our study of the history of it, that it can result in very bad things, war, mayhem, uh, in enhanced political power. <clears throat> so I think it's best to tell the truth. <laughs> you heard it here. I, think so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know why that's so astonishing, but there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> let me suggest, see what you think. Right. But this sort of thing hasn't ended. It hasn't ended with well, the war. Well, of course not. Of course hasn't not. hasn't ended, you know, in history. Right. And I, the human condition, um, the way things evolve on the planet, yeah. we're going to see this again. Oh, yeah, abso times, so. absolutely. Because, uh, uh, you know, strong men uh, who would like to gain more traction will always use these kind of tactics if they're not stopped by a free press, by constitutional limits, by a public that denounces it. So, Fortunately, we have those three things. We have a free press, we have a constitution, and we have a public that is in about 55% opposed to this guy, and, a, and even more than that opposed to a wall. So uh, it's, it's, I think we're okay. I enjoy your optimism, John. <laughs> as long as those things stay in place, yeah, yeah, I think we're okay. we'll be okay. I think we're going to be, we have I think to watch we're be, okay, be sure Jay. they do stay in place. Yeah, absolutely. We have to be vig vigilant, yes. <laughs> Thank you, John. Sure, you're welcome, Jim. Great to talk to you. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs>